Interested in working on Alaska's North Slope or putting your cooking skills to use in America's last frontier? Come check out job opportunities in Alaska with NMS, Alaska's leading facilities and food services provider. NMS has opportunities for cooks, security officers, and maintenance throughout Alaska. You will receive excellent pay, benefits, and the opportunity for advancement and promotion. And all new employees receive a signing bonus. Find your next career opportunity at NMSUSA.com and apply online today. Imagine an ER waiting room with your favorite blanket and pillow, your cat's pixel and widget, and your mom's chicken soup. At Dignity Health, we know the only thing worse than being in pain is being stuck in an ER waiting room. So we offer in quicker. You get an estimated ER arrival time online so you can start your wait at home. It's just another way of putting leading edge medicine within easy reach. Learn more at strosehospitals.org slash ER. Dignity Health, including St. Rose Dominicans, Rose de Lima, San Martin, and Siena campuses in Henderson and Las Vegas. Hello, human kindness. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. What's up, everybody, and greetings from Sin City. To everybody who participated last night in the live stream, like usual, thank you very much. Always a great time. I mean, we cover so many different topics, and we talk about so many different things that it's just a... uh, a very, very enjoyable time, and if you haven't joined us on a Sunday yet, I definitely think that next Sunday is the perfect time to do just that. All right, so let's move on to our article this morning, and I'm going to keep the monologue very short, considering the article is a little lengthy. We're going to talk today about the scientists that were in Jeffrey Epstein's circle, and what it was like being one of those scientists. We have an article today from Daniel Engber, and this article is from 2019 and from Slate. And he goes into what it was like to be around Jeffrey Epstein, what the scientists, what it was like for all of them, and what the situation was with all of these high-powered, high-profile members of academia. Now we've talked a lot about academia pretty much since the beginning of the of of the podcast and as of late we've dived right back into it. So I figured with a little bit of a lull in the action that we dive right back in and we talk a little bit more about these smarmy sons of bitches inside of the world of academia. So, let's jump into this article from Slate, and let's see what Daniel Engber has to say. Headline, The Girls Were Always Around. What it was like to be a scientist in Jeffrey Epstein's circle. Right off the bat, you say to yourself, Okay, so the girls were all around all the time, but nobody had any idea, huh? Nobody was none the wiser. You just thought that Jeffrey Epstein was some sort of Casanova. Some sort of, uh, you know, in his prime, Brad Pitt. And the girls are just flocking to him because he's such a good-looking guy. Is that what you folks really thought? Certainly wasn't just the money, right? I mean, he has to be just this, this fantastically handsome man, according to these scientists. Had nothing to do with the money, had nothing to do with... Just to, Jeffrey Epstein was just a handsome man, so all these girls were hanging around him. That's basically their excuse. When in reality, every one of these scientists that were hanging out at the Edge Foundation, down at Brockman's dinners, flying to Jeffrey Epstein's island, all of these people should be answering hard questions. Every last one of them. This article was published on August 2nd of 2019. It's summer 2010, and Jeffrey Epstein has just returned to New York City after serving out an 18-month sentence in Palm Beach, if you want to call it that. How about a, uh, a vacation where he was allowed to leave six out of seven days for 13 hours a day? Florida, including parole, for soliciting prostitution from a minor. Again, imagine trying to defend, even if that was his only charge, say. You're out here solicitating prostitution from a minor. Now, do you really think that would have been the first time he got caught doing it? And that's what these scientists want you to believe. That's what all of these academics want you to believe. 
that they had no idea what Jeffrey Epstein was, even after his arrest. Yeah, right, okay? You don't go out there and solicit prostitution from children. I mean, kids can't be prostitutes, but you know, my, you know, you know what I'm trying to say here. If you have all of that money, and you're high profile, and you have proclivities, and you have an itch that needs to be scratched, why would you be going after these little girls? You have all of that money. Go get yourself an actual, you know, a, a sex worker who is in the business, you, one of the, an escort or something. But it wasn't about that. It was about the power and the fact that Jeffrey Epstein liked little girls, point blank, period. He's hosting a dinner at his townhouse on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. To his left is John Brockman, the literary super agent who seems to represent every scientist who's ever written a best-selling book. Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Jared Diamond, Daniel Kahneman, and so forth. Brockman has brought along a client, a young professor whose line of research interests Epstein. Across the table, and to Epstein's right, is an aspiring fashion model and her companion. So Jeffrey Epstein has all of these, you know, high profile uh, people at his dinner, you know, all these uh, academics and scientists, and you, you just heard some of the names. Um, that John Brockman has been in charge of getting their books out. Some of the most high-profile people in academia. And all these people are hanging out with Epstein. Hanging around the house. At his townhouse. After he's been arrested. Taking his money. Eating his food. Laughing at his jokes. And having a good old time. Meanwhile, everybody knows what Epstein is at this point. And any of these scientists that try to deny it, well... I'll, I'll, I'll brand them right here and now as liars, to be honest with you, because that's what I think about them. I don't think they're being truthful. I don't think any of these academics, to be honest with you, have come forward and done the right thing. Have any of these people uh, uh, spoke with authorities on the record? I mean, maybe behind the scenes and we don't know about it, but as far as we know, seems like there's been a lot of circling of the wagons and a lot of cover-your-ass situations and nobody stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, look, this is effed up. This whole entire industry, the, the, the whole entire cottage industry of having these parasitic relationships with these billionaires needs to be looked at. Nobody's doing that besides people like Dr. Stephen DeLay. Yet these academics continue to make these funky moves. They continue to hang out with people like Jeffrey Epstein. What do you think, Epstein was the only one? How many more of these disgusting bastards are hidden? How many of these disgusting people are conducting themselves the same way Epstein was? There's no crosstalk or conversation between these pairs of guests. It's more like Epstein has convened two separate interactions for his private entertainment. And these just happen to be coinciding, both in time and space. He would alternate between us, recalled the professor, who asked that his name not be included in this story. Oh, that's, that's rich. That is rich. If I was writing this story and someone said to me, oh, can you not include my name in this story? I would tell them, um, no. What do you mean, not include your name? What, are you embarrassed you were hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein? Unnamed academic guy. Have you went and talked with the FBI yet? Have you spoken with the authorities? What do you mean, unnamed? The time for being unnamed in this story has long passed. Sometimes he turned to his left and asked some sciencey questions. Then he turned to his right and asked the model to show him her portfolio. At one point, a young female st staffer stepped into the room to give Epstein a massage, rubbing his neck as he talked and listened. So this is normal behavior, huh, at a, a, a meeting for academics. A bunch of scientists sitting around with a clown like Jeffrey Epstein. He's getting a massage from some, who knows how old girl, looking at her modeling portfolio while he's sitting around some of the, the, the greatest minds of science. And none of these people thought that was weird, huh? None of these people thought that was strange or out of bounds. Makes you wonder what is wrong with all of these people. No one seems to know that much about Epstein's occupation, but there's little doubt about the ways he'd like to spend his time. I only have two interests, he once told a longtime friend and former academic, science and the P-word. That sounds about right. 
And I'd, I'd throw a couple other things in there too. Money laundering. Theft. Wholesale lying. Abuse. You name it. Those are all Jeffrey Epstein's go-to moves. But definitely science and the P word were the two things that were on his mind quite a bit. And they both were means to an end for Jeffrey Epstein, right? You know, the science was a way to, you know, forward some of his weirder ideas and thoughts. And like I always say, I think it's an untalked about part of the scientific and academic story. What sort of access did these scientists have to confidential projects, private projects, And did that information get into the hands of whoever the highest bidder might have been? Because we know Jeffrey Epstein wasn't some sort of patriot. We know that Jeffrey Epstein was all about consolidation of power and wealth. And if he was in the business of blackmail and compromise like we believe he was, then you would think that he also had dossiers on these scientists. And these scientists that were working on... Projects that that could have been classified. Well, did did Epstein get access to any of these projects? Who knows? It seems those interests overlapped. As the New York Times reported on Wednesday, Epstein's passion for cutting-edge science at times verged into eugenics. And we've talked about that a lot. Jeffrey Epstein had, like, this fixation with eugenics. He had, like, this fixation with... Um, you know, seeding the human race with his DNA. And down at Zorro Ranch, in, in the outside of Santa Fe, it was the perfect place for him to do that. So again, like usual, when I mention Santa Fe or Zorro Ranch, I have to throw in the obligatory, why has it not been raided yet? What in the F is going on in New Mexico? Multiple sources told the Times that Epstein had described a plan to inseminate woman, women at his ranch outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. According to a shakier second-hand account, also relayed to the Times, Epstein said he wanted to use his ranch to impregnate 20 women at a time as a means of strengthening the gene pool. Now think about that for a minute, folks. Strengthening the gene pool? What gene pool? Humanity in general's gene pool, or I don't know what this idiot's talking about, the gene pool. The Times also says that Epstein had an interest in cryogenics, and that he told one adherent of transhumanism that upon his death, he'd like to have both his head and penis put on ice. When we first covered this, I was... I couldn't believe what I was reading. I mean, really? You want to have your penis and your head cut off and put on ice? What do you think you're going to come back at a later point, like Frankenstein? What do you think, Dr. Frankenstein's showing up, going to put together a corpse and then add your head to it and bring you back to life or something? I mean, all of this stuff harkens back to the Nazis and their eugenics experiments and whatnot. I mean, it's all the same playbook that we've seen from those sick bastards. Epstein was into the same shit. Transhumanism? Seeding the DNA pool? Eugenics? Sure sounds like some shit the Nazis were up to, if you ask me. This can't have been an earnest scheme, though the Times implies it was. It would make no sense for anyone to reanimate disembodied penis. Still, Epstein's joke plays off the nature and extent of his dual obsessions. I don't know if it was a joke, honestly. We're talking about a guy who was into a lot of wild and weird shit. And who knows what he was into, you know, in his in his personal life, what sort of uh, wacky beliefs he might have harbored that, you know, n- not many people knew about. So who knows about the head cut off and the penis cut off and put on ice? Who knows what the real motivations behind that was or what his thinking was behind that if it was a real statement? His pursuits of sex and science weren't merely carried out in, in parallel but all at once and often in full view. Yeah, it sure was in full view. So where were all of these scientists who were hanging out with Epstein? Where were they going and beating the drums? Where were they leading the charge to stop all of this? They were there. They were on the ground. They were enriching themselves from Jeffrey Epstein's ill-gotten gains. 
Hello, my name is Rico. I'd like to meet you. When Epstein convened 21 physicists on his private island for a 2006 meeting on gravity, for example, he was always followed by a group of something like three or four young women, one participant told the New York Times. Yeah, because that's normal. That's normal for a guy like Epstein to just be followed around by all of these women and all of this stuff on this island while it's a a science conference. What he was doing was flossing, showing these scientists, hey, look what I can offer. Look what I have down here. Look at my uh, look at my situation and my setup. And it can all be yours as well. You can have whatever you want down here. This is Epstein's island. And then they'd get caught up in the whole situation because they're sick bastards and their temptation led them to a monster like Epstein's embrace and then their own sick proclivities led them to take part. But you mean to tell me it's normal for a guy hosting an event like this for a bunch of uh, pocket protector scientists to have a bunch of hot girls trailing him around? None of these dorky ass scientists thought that was odd. That meeting's organizer, the cosmologist Lawrence Krauss, remained friends with Epstein during and after his prison sentence. He told the Daily Beast in 2011 that speaking as scientists, there was no reason to believe that Epstein was committing crimes. I always judge things on empirical evidence, he said, and he always has women ages 19 to 23 around him, but I've never seen anything else. Well, it's good to know that uh, Lawrence Krauss is not only a cosmologist, but he is an expert in figuring out how old people are by just looking at them. Pretty uh, varied skill set that this man has. A pretty varied toolbox that he shows up to the job site with. Maybe he should give up being a cosmologist and he should come to Vegas and use his skills of picking out women or people who are uh, 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 not of age. And he'd be a great resource to uh, the casinos. I mean, is he for real? What do you, how do you know how old these girls are? What if they're 16 but dolled up to look like they're 23 or 24? Because that never happens, right? Epstein's former neighbor, the psychologist and computer scientist Robert Shank, describes another such event that he attended. A meeting of artificial intelligence experts, organized by Marvin Minsky, who is credibly accused by Virginia Roberts of partaking in her abuse, by the way, and held on Epstein's Island in April 2002. What, does it shock you that Minsky would have an event on Epstein's Island considering their connection, considering that they're such good friends? Of course not. Minsky is somebody who really needs to be put on blast. Nobody really talks about him. Besides a few folks and a few different uh, articles, there's really nothing out there on what Minsky is alleged to have done. Epstein walks into the conference with two girls on his arm, said Shank. The scientists were holding their discussions in a small room, and as they talked, Epstein was in the back on a couch, hugging and kissing these girls. Because that is exactly the behavior of somebody who is interested in science. That's the behavior of somebody who wants to move the ball forward. That's the behavior of somebody who should be taken seriously by some of the most powerful minds in academia. No, it is not, but yet here we are. Yet they did take him seriously, and they did keep coming back, with their hands open and supposedly their eyes closed. Like Krauss, Shank says that Epstein always had young women in his company. The first time they ever met, over lunch at Epstein's house, it was me, him, and six girls, Shank said. Like Krauss, he insists that none of Epstein's girls were underage. You know, it's an uncanny ability all of these guys have all of a sudden to delineate the ages of these girls by just looking at them. I mean, wow. Pretty awesome skill that these guys have and a keen eye to boot. They might have been in their early 20s or late teens, but when I talked to them, they were always in college or had just graduated college or something like that. They were not high school girls. Yeah, according to them, because, you know, they couldn't have been playing their part, right? We know that Epstein had these girls playing a part to get blackmail on powerful people. So, that couldn't have been it. They couldn't have been playing a part. You know for sure, 100%, that every one of those girls was overage, huh? You certainly know that. 
well, I think you should have to uh, talk about this under oath. I think that he should be brought in under deposition, Shank and Krauss and all the other people that were there, and they should have to speak on this under oath. The scientists were, in their own way, members of Epstein's entourage. Beautiful women are only a part of it, wrote the journalist Landon Thomas in 2002 profile of Epstein for New York. Because here's the thing about Epstein. As some collect butterflies, he collects beautiful minds. Oh, what rosy words. What, what beautiful words by Landon Thomas Jr. Painting such a rosy picture of this disgusting bastard Jeffrey Epstein. That phrase comes up in other places too. Jeffrey's hobby was, was scientists. He liked to collect them. An anonymous associate told Connie Bruck for her recent piece on Alan Dershowitz in The New Yorker. So, I'm not going to sit here and act like these scientists are all victims either. They knew what they were doing. They were going in with their eyes open. And they knew what Jeffrey Epstein was. They knew the kind of man he was. And they knew what he was involved with. But they simply didn't care, folks. Because guess what? It's all about the money. That is what it comes down to. It's all about the money that Epstein was providing these guys. 20 scientists, 20 scientists were flown in for that island meeting on AI in 2002, of which 18 were men. Among the famous physicists who were present for the 2006 meeting, a dozen have been publicly identified and 10 were men. When Epstein arranged to host another science conference at his island home in 2010, not long after his first stint in prison, his guests included 11 men and 2 women. And one thing we have learned from the Epstein fiasco is that there definitely are women involved in this. And according to an article that we read here on air, I believe it's like 39% of people involved in human trafficking from the trafficking standpoint are in fact female. So, you know, you, you just you, you just can't tell, right? You never know these days. And that's one thing that the, the case here has shown me. I would never, ever suspect somebody like Ghislaine Maxwell being involved in something like this. And that's why the whole entire operation was so genius, right? Epstein had it locked and loaded and had that blueprint completely laid out and everybody played their part to a T. Recent rundowns of Epstein's science funding, his science fandom, and his science friends show the, ex- the extent of his division. Almost every science scholar whom he said to have courted or supported is a man. Lawrence Krauss, Marvin Minsky, and Roger Shank. Also, Gregory Benford, George Church, Murray Gelman, Stephen Jay Gould, David, David Gross, Stephen Hawking, Danny Hillis, Gerard Tehuft, Stephen Kosling, Jaron Lanier, Seth Lloyd, Martin Nowak, Oliver Sacks, Lee Smolin, Robert Trivers, Frank Willicek, and more. Now, some those names are some of the most renowned names in the scientific community, folks, as you all know. Names that have been involved in huge scientific breakthroughs and discoveries and all of that. But the fact remains. None of that makes it acceptable for their role within Jeffrey Epstein's enterprise, be it enabling or whatever else it might have been. My point is, all of these people, all of these people who were on this island, all of these people who were at these events, and they're saying right here in print that they were around and there was a bunch of girls around, the FBI needs to speak with all of these people. Among the only women I can find in this group is Harvard's Anne Harrington, who took a grant from Epstein around 1999-1998. Lanier told the New York Times that when well-credentialed women did show up at Epstein's genius gatherings, he wondered if it might be so they could be screened as potential breeding partners. This is what he thought about women. Some of the finest minds in the world, some incredibly intelligent scientists who happen to be female. But to Jeffrey Epstein, they're just breeders. They're just people that might be able to be part of his eugenics program. And I wouldn't be shocked if these other scientists felt the same way. It was one of these women, he said, who described Epstein's 20-at-a-time breeding project in New Mexico. Lanier could not recall her name and did not mention Harrington. So... 
again, there are so many people out here with stories. There are so many people out here that know about Jeffrey Epstein and what he was up to and the scumbaggery that was going on at these events. Have these people been brought forward? Let's build the complete profile here. Let's get it started. Let's get cracking. What is what's the what are the feds waiting for? News reports and legal filings suggest that Epstein's women and his girls were treated as commodities, allegedly shipped from place to place on private aircraft, allegedly photographed and turned into porn collectibles, allegedly passed around for sex with fellow VIPs. And all of that, unfortunately, according to the circumstantial evidence, looks to be true. And then you add to the circumstantial evidence the eyewitness accounts from people like Virginia, and it really sets a damning profile and a damning situation for all of these people who were involved. And these academics who have been avoiding this fallout, you boys and girls better get yourself some iodine and a radiation suit. Because these clouds are glowing. Women were even swapped from one Lech's employ to another's. New York Magazine reports that Epstein referred five women to Charlie Rose as possible assistants. One, he said, used to work for Harvey Weinstein. He's lucky if he can get her. I mean, Charlie Rose is another scumbag, another member of the legacy media, folks. A darling of the legacy media, in fact. Until the report started coming out. So again, you know, all of these people in the legacy media have some nerve. They really have some nerve when they get up there on their ivory tower and shout down at the rest of us that we're not living our lives correctly. Well, here's an idea. You people are in a position to actually make change. You're in a position to blow this shit out of the water. But what do you do? Instead... No, nah, we're not going to run that story because we want to keep access to the royals. We want to make sure that we have access to the Joe Exotic of the Windsor family. It is absurd. There is a crude lightness in the ways that Epstein solicited the men and women and girls that aroused his interests and in how he reached for what he wanted. Among Epstein's circles of super rich, genius men to be swapped and traded too. Another recent profile of Dershowitz, this one in the New York Magazine, describes a late 1990s birthday party for Epstein's loyal friend, the billionaire Leslie Wexner. And again, Alan Dershowitz acts like him and Epstein were just, it was a a purely business relationship. We know that's not the case. Stop lying to us, alright? Alan Bolonovich, king of BS. In lieu of gifts, the story says, Wexner asked each of his guests to bring the smartest person that he or she had met that year. Epstein's offering that time was Dershowitz, a beautiful mind flown out to Ohio on Epstein's private jet and shared with a wealthy friend. And again, that's what Epstein was in the business of, providing things for the rich and wealthy. And when I say things, I don't mean, you know, normal middleman type things. I'm talking about young girls, money services to hide that money. That sort of thing. That's what Epstein was. That's the kind of man he was. And all of these people who act like they had no idea are lying to you. That's my opinion. Over time, Epstein would build a network for procuring brilliant men. Chief among his fixers was the super agent John Brockman. Brockman declined to comment for this story. Now, I have also sent an email to John Brockman that was never answered to get some questions about this. And I highly doubt that any of these people that I send emails to have any interest in speaking with me. But if any of them do, if they're listening to this podcast by chance or they get wind of this, feel free to shoot me some email to explain yourself. Because from where I'm sitting, no comment is as damning as damning could be. And somebody like John Brockman especially should really be coming out and speaking on what he knows. When Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Steven Pinker flew out to a TED conference on Epstein's private jet in 2002, their agent Brockman was on board as well. Pinker's scanty ties to Epstein have been singled out in recent weeks. He says he only boarded Epstein's jet because of Brockman. Once again, shows you that Brockman's a problem. Throwing Brockman under the bus, so fine. Brockman's the problem then. 
Let's bring him in. He needs to be questioned and un- under oath. What's going on? All of these people need to be brought in. I truly hope that when all is said and done, that this investigation really digs deep into the, this sort of thing. Because these allegations, all these people that we're talking about here, these, these scientists especially, a lot of them have been named directly as people who participated in the abuse. So like I always say, there's levels to this, right? You have the enablers, and, but the very bottom rung of hell, the worst of the worst, are the people who actually participated in this abuse. And that's a lot of these uh, scientists, you know, according to Virginia. Roger Shank says it was Brockman who introduced him to Epstein, too. Everybody goes through John Brockman, he told me. Uh, Again, John Brockman really needs to be brought in. John Brockman really needs to be talked to because, boy, oh boy, this is uh, he's, he's a ridiculous man inside of this story. And there is nowhere near enough being talked about with John Brockman. It's Brockman's job to help his clients make connections. Epstein, in turn, helped pay for Brockman's salon for science intellectuals, the Edge Foundation. And the Edge Foundation is another group of all of these super intelligent academic types. They get together and they have these meetings. Right uh, of of a me- literally a meeting of the minds, and Epstein was big with the Edge Foundation, big with John Brockman, and he was big on funding a lot of these scientists. According to the Miami Herald's analysis of public filings from three of Epstein's charitable organizations, Edge received at least four hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars between nineteen ninety-eight and two thousand and five. So, was that money ill-gotten gains? Was that money that Jeffrey Epstein um, made from criminal activity? If so, the Edge Foundation should be part of RICO. The Jeffrey Epstein Virgin Islands Foundation once claimed in a press release to have provided substantial backing for Edge, which is there described as a treasure trove of over 660 virtuosi geniuses and masterminds. What? What? Masterminds, these people are disgusting, folks, okay? All of these academics, all of these people that were hanging out with Epstein, breaking bread on his island, going to these Edge Foundation meetings with uh, Epstein sitting around and hanging out, where are all of, it, all of them? How come none of these people have come out and given a full accounting of what occurred at, when they were with Epstein? Disclosure, I responded to one of Brockman's annual questions in 2008, and my answer is still on Edge's website, along with a defunct bio page. I also attended an Edge event on the science of morality in 2010. Not me, by the way, that's the the the, uh, the person writing the article. I don't think I'd be getting invited to uh, any Edge Foundation meetings, okay? As a self-described member of the Edge community... Epstein often delved into the treasure trove of the group's billionaire's dinner, Brockman's yearly gathering of the outstanding minds, at which the richest people in the world come together with the most intelligent people in history. Oh yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Evil Dr. Doctor, uh, Dr. Evil type dudes in the back room with billions and billions of dollars collecting scientists who need this money to move their research forward and God knows what sort of projects are being worked on. What could possibly go wrong? The whole world is going to turn into the island of, the, of Dr. Moreau if these people have their way. Also present at those billionaire dinners on at least two occasions... Epstein's potential co-conspirator, Sarah Kellen, who, according to court filings, was a key figure in the administration of his network of, air quotes, masseuses. We definitely know that Sarah Kellen was down there a lot. We know she was with Epstein all the time, right-hand woman with Maxwell. So, just like Kellen and the rest of the core four, all of these people that are coming out and writing these articles, that's all fine and well, and we appreciate it, of course. But I hope that all of these people are speaking to the authorities. 
Another Brockman client, Cornell University psychologist David Pizarro, remembers seeing Epstein at a meeting held at Brockman's Eastover Farm Estate in Connecticut in 2013. At one point during the meeting, says Pizarro, a helicopter touched down and the financier, pedophile, popped out with a young Slavic-looking woman. The scientists were all in awe that a billionaire with a private helicopter had come to listen to what they had to say, he recalled. Aw, oh, isn't that nice? Everyone's in awe of Mr. Billionaire showing up to listen to what they have to say. So much in awe that they're willing to overlook the fact that he is a pedophile, an abuser of women, and a general all-around piece of shit. One, one young Slavic-looking woman who spent lots of time with Epstein was his pilot and f- and former... Uh, a, a, a bu- uh, excuse me. Survivor, Nadia March- March- uh, Marchenko, also known as the Gulfstream Girl. According to police reports, Epstein told at least one of his alleged survivors that Marchenko had been purchased from her family in Yugoslavia. Now, that was what he told Virginia. That... Um, Nadia was purchased from her parents with the help of Brunel and brought to America for Jeffrey Epstein. That's the story behind Nadia Mar- Martinchenko. And if you want to dig in a little bit deeper in that, I have obviously a, a, a bunch of episodes that go deeper into that situation. On this topic and many others, Shank offered defense. What does that mean, a sex slave, he said. This is a thing I don't like the media for, because they come up with these ideas. Sex slave. He bought her from her parents, and yes, he was having sex with her. Her and 17 other girls, he added. I didn't see her as being underage. I did occasionally talk to her because she was around a lot. She didn't seem like a child. Oh, well, that's you, you, you've, you've settled it then. I mean, you, you have settled it. You know, she didn't look like a child, so she obviously wasn't a child, Mr. Pizarro. You have put the whole entire mystery to rest. Really? Again, with she didn't look young. And that's their, that's the excuse they'll use, right? Because they know that that excuse, while it is obviously BS, it's the only one that they possibly can use. As for the eugenic stuff, Shank says it's nonsense to suggest that Epstein meant to see the human race with his DNA. He did want to be a father, though, and by many different women. About 15 years ago, Shank said, when Epstein had just turned 50, the two had a long conversation about parenting. Epstein wanted to have a baby or multiple babies, but he wasn't planning to get married or spend much time with any of the families that he created. He wanted to know what would happen if he impregnated lots of different girls and then helped them out financially. Would the kids come out the way he wanted? Again, who thinks like that? Who thinks like that? Oh, let me just have a bunch of kids and then leave them with their, their mothers and I'll, I'll provide for them financially just to see how they come out. These are human beings we're talking about and he's acting like they're some sort of science experiment? His own children? And anyone could possibly believe that he'd have any compunction abusing children that weren't his own? Shank wrote about this conversation for his, his 2005 book, Lessons in Learning, E-Learning and Training. Though in that text, he refers to Epstein only as a friend who lives the kind of life that many men fantasize about. And, shall we say, moral morality doesn't come up much. Shank, you're a liar, okay? Right in your own book, you said morality doesn't doesn't come up much, blah, 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 blah. But then at the same time, you act like you had no idea what he was up to, that he was a a scum, that he was a scumbag and, and, you know, uh, abusing girls, etc., etc. It's, it's disgusting that all of these people have gotten away with this for so long. The days of the academics getting over on this stuff are long over, folks. Shank offers his advice as an expert in educational psychology. Epstein would be wise to keep the mothers of his, of, of his offspring from shacking up with other men. Otherwise, he might lose control of the children's development. Little by little, my friend's children would be his only genetically if he wasn't careful, Shank writes. That's chilling, folks. I mean, honestly, that is absolutely chilling. They're talking about Epstein's future children. Thank God we, you know, there is none that we know about. Being used as science experiments, basically, for him to observe from afar. 
almost as if they're in a Petri dish, and he's some sort of scientist leaning over in his um, microscope to see what's going on. It tells you everything you need to know about Epstein, but it also tells you what you need to know about this clown Shank. Based on his reading of this week's story in the Times, Shank now wonders if maybe Epstein changed his mind and decided that the mothers of his children should all live with him and one another in New Mexico. The fact that he came up with a new plan is not surprising to me, Shank said. Now that, that strikes me as true, right? A whole entire harem, basically, as if he was one of his buddies from Saudi Arabia in the nice privacy of his desert getaway at Zorro Ranch. That's t- totally a plausible scenario for me, folks, honestly, to buy into. And you know, I don't really buy into the, the far-fetched in this story. But that certainly seems plausible. Epstein have a house full of young girls where they're all, he's impregnating them and he's running an experiment. That does not seem too far out of, uh, to left field for me, folks. He was intent on clarifying that he always felt Epstein's intentions, even with the women, were benign. This guy was actually not a bad guy, Shank told me at the end of our conversation. I mean, put the 14-year-olds out of the picture. Those even make me think he was a bad guy. But to my knowledge, he was not a bad guy. He was a good guy. Put the 14-year-olds out of the picture? Uh, what? No, that's never going to happen. That's at the forefront of the picture, sir. How about that? How about you put Jeffrey Epstein's money that he was donating to you out of the picture? You epic idiot. Look, folks, it is long overdue that the world of academia has its reckoning. And as this story continues to grow, and as we come closer and closer to Ghislaine Maxwell's trial, you better believe that we will continue pulling this thread until its conclusion. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y. C-A-P-U-C-C-I at ProtonMail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. To everybody who has helped out the podcast with donations, thank you folks very, very much. All right, everybody, I will be back later on and we will pick up where we left off. Have a great day, everyone. Interested in working on Alaska's North Slope or putting your cooking skills to use in America's last frontier? Come check out job opportunities in Alaska with NMS, Alaska's leading facilities and food services provider. NMS has opportunities for cooks, security officers, and maintenance throughout Alaska. You will receive excellent pay, benefits, and the opportunity for advancement and promotion. And all new employees receive a signing bonus. Find your next career opportunity at NMSUSA.com and apply online today. The heart sets us apart It beats and ticks And over the years it's taken a few licks But your heart doesn't just beat for you It beats for your friends and family And your grandson Drew So let's make it stronger Cause a healthy heart loves longer Every heart deserves a specialist Find yours at Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican Hospitals Hello, human kindness